G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Life of the Messiah. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian walk. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so welcome to this session, and tonight we're looking at uh, paragraphs 72 to 76. And uh, last session, we looked at Jesus's power over disease and death, and, and that was with uh, the healing of, um, uh, of uh, the woman with the issue of blood, and death was the raising of Jairus's daughter. Um, the woman with the issue of blood stuck up behind Jesus when he was all pressed in and uh, touched the hem of his garment, and, uh, and that was a demonstration of her faith there, and... Uh, you know, Jesus says, oh, who touched me? And, you know, the disciples were a bit miffed about that because everybody was touching him. And uh, Jesus said to the woman that it was not uh, the fact that you touched me, but it was your faith that made you whole and she was instantly healed. Now, Jairus uh, heard that conversation and his daughter is now dead. And uh, they end up uh, at his home where all the the weepers are there, the mourners are there, and Jesus turfs them all out, and he goes in with three disciples, and he just says to the young woman, arise, and she rises up. Again, they're all amazed. And um, remember in this, from chapter from chapter 12 of Matthew onwards, from uh, chapter paragraph 61, everything now is done on the basis of personal need and personal faith. Jesus doesn't just doesn't do miracles for the sake of doing miracles anymore. There has to be a personal need and it has to be on personal faith. Um, we also see that there are two blind men who were following Jesus and they called out to him, their son of David. Jesus didn't respond. Why? Because son of David is a messianic title and, and Jesus is not offering himself as their Messiah anymore. He has rescinded that offer of the kingdom. And uh, now it's, uh, he doesn't answer to that title. Uh, what we see, though, is that when he goes privately into a house and the two blind men follow him in, um, they have we know what their personal need is. I want to see. And he says, you believe I can do this? They said, yes. And boom, sight restored. So Jesus, once again, we see casting a dumb demon also. Uh, the people were amazed. The dumb man spoke. People were amazed. But once again, the hard-hearted Pharisees said he does it by the power of the by the power of the prince of the demons Beelzebub so they're not having a bargain we also saw his final rejection in his hometown of Nazareth he was teaching in their synagogues up there in the synagogue and they got pretty miffed about him teaching them they were pretty much offended actually in his teaching why because as far as they were concerned listen you grew up in this place and you went to the school system here and you are not smart enough to be teaching us because uh, you never attended any rabbinic schools or anything like that. So they believe that Jesus was pretty arrogant in teaching them about the scriptures. And as a result of that, he didn't do many mighty works up there in, in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Now, having been rejected up there, he now sends his disciples on a mission. Uh, and the reason for the mission is because he looked upon the, 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 uh, the state of the people as uh, they were distressed and they were scattered as sheep, not having a shepherd. Um, so what he's saying is that, listen, in, in amongst this mass of people here, there are sheep in there who were, who were the believing remnant and they need to have, they need to be continued to be ministered to. So, you know, he, he was looking out for them. He sends his disciples out to go only to the Jews because you know his mission was only to the Jews, and what are they going to tell them? They're going to tell them about God's kingdom program, the fact that it's it's uh, been uh, postponed, um, and also uh, he gave them the the uh, the authority to uh, perform miracles and signs and things like that. He told them to trust God for necessities that God would provide on this ministry trip, and. Uh, their ministry was now to individuals. It wasn't to the masses anymore. And so what they'd do is they'd go into a town if they found somebody worthy there and somebody worthy would actually be a believer who would be part of the believing remnant of that day. They were to stay with them 
if they if they were met by non-believers or the non-worthy, he says, shake the dust off your feet as a sign of judgment against them. Now, Jesus told his disciples in uh, about the fact that there is coming persecution for them. And he says, listen, uh, when you're in a position where you, 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 you look like you're going to be persecuted or, uh, you know, or hurt, he says, be as shrewd as a serpent in trying to avoid being hurt. But he said, if you can't avoid being hurt, well, be as harmless as a dove. Um, he also tells his disciples that persecution will grow in intensity. We saw that it started off in the family, in your own household, and then it went to all people, and then it went to the cities. So it, it grows in intensity. He also told them that they too would be rejected and accused of being demon possessed, but still they were to boldly proclaim the message of, of, of uh, the, the kingdom program. And he told them not to fear uh, simply because don't fear men, but he says, you need to fear God and you're, you're my servants. So you just fear God and not men. You just do what you're told to do. He also says that they need to, um, uh, those that he that they're talking to need to affirm uh, either uh, Jesus or deny him and that has to do with the coming uh, AD 70 judgment so where we are up to today we're, we're still in paragraph 72 and this is the witness um, in, in view of rejection and here is the results of that rejection that we saw in Nazareth now he deals here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 39. And here Jesus gives three specific points to his disciples. Uh, and what we see first up in, in uh, Matthew 10, 34 to 36, Jesus now points out that he will now become the division in a Jewish home and in the Jewish community. Jesus will be the point of division. For he says in verse 34, Think not that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but the sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So the emphasis here is that he now becomes the point of division. You're either for him or you're against him. Now, had he been accepted as the Messianic king, then the kingdom would have been accepted. Then there would have been peace and unity for Israel. But at this time, no such kingdom could be established without accepting him as that Messianic king. So in place of peace, it's now a sword and it is now division. And this has been seen right throughout Jewish history. Uh, the Jewish family unit is usually a, a very close unit. And as soon as one member becomes a believer in Jesus, there's an automatic instantaneous division. So as a result of the rejection in place of unity, uh, there is now division. And in place of peace, there is now a sword. Uh, if we were to look into uh, Malachi chapter four, verses four to five, uh, we see there that Elijah, the prophet Elijah, will have to come before that great and terrible day of Jehovah, which is the, uh, which is the tribulation period. And he is going to come back physically to begin to correct the lack of peace and unity concerning the Messiah. So not only will there be division within the family unit, but we also see that Jerusalem and the temple are destined for destruction. And this is also a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 8, where he points out that uh, when Emmanuel uh, finally arrives, which, which is Jesus, he will be the point of division between the remnant and the non-remnant. And so this also fulfills the prophecy of Simeon in Luke 2. 29 to 36, when, when Simeon uh, the, had that, that young baby in his hands. For the remnant, he'll be their sanctuary, but onto the non-remnant, 
he'll be the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Now, in uh, secondly, in uh, 37 to 38 of Matthew 10, uh, the coming of the Messiah means that he is now the symbol of acceptance or rejection. So first up, he's a point of division. Now he's a symbol of acceptance or of rejection. So now the individual believer must make a full commitment to discipleship. And this means that they have to choose between Messiah and the family. And now we're talking about the Jewish, Jewish believers here. For the family must be rejected for the sake of following the Messiah. Uh, and in verse 38, when Jesus says here that taking up the cross, they must fully identify the, ourselves with his rejection. Now, we know that salvation is based on pure faith and trust in the death of Messiah who died for our sins. But discipleship means a, a much greater commitment that needs to be carefully thought out, but it really needs to be made. Um, he's called us to be disciples. So the third thing we see here now is that in verse 39, we see the necessity of losing one's life in Messiah. So he goes on to say here, so that he that findeth his life shall lose it, he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. The context of this verse is very important here because it dealt with the consequences of the unpardonable sin. And so what we see here is that if a person tried to save his life and escape persecution by denying Jesus, he would end up losing his life in the AD 70 judgment. And uh, that's what the, the book of Hebrews, it, it, that's the, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers exactly in that position. However, if a believer died as a martyr, he would find true life and will be especially rewarded during the Messianic kingdom. So that in the Messianic kingdom, there are going to be those who will be rewarded and those who will not be rewarded, even though they're in the kingdom. So there is the necessity of losing one's life in the Messiah, means that he is all in all. He's above family. Now we see the rewards for individuals who accept. And again, we're still in Matthew, and this is Matthew 10, verse 40 to 42. In the last point that we just looked at here, Jesus was talking about uh, rewards for the individuals who accept the apostles' teachings. Uh, and this is what we're looking at here. The principle here is that uh, those who receive the apostles yeah, yeah, are viewed as having received Jesus himself. So he sent the apostles out. Those who receive the the message of the apostles, it's as if they were accepting the message of Jesus himself or having received Jesus himself. Because remember, uh, when we we're talking about the centurion back uh, way back in paragraph 55, uh, we, we saw there that when one responds to the ambassador, uh, one is receiving the one himself who sent the ambassador. So it's the same as receiving the, the, uh, the one who sent him. So what we see here is that uh, the person who receives a prophet and the word of the prophet shall receive the reward of the prophet. Uh, the same principle also applies for the reception of the righteous man. Uh, also, he goes on to say, uh, whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, Verily, I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So even giving a follower of the Messiah a cup of water for the sake of the Messiah will bring its reward. Something as simple and basic as that. Uh, the task, uh, how it, even though it might appear very insignificant, even if it's simply being you know, the, the one who vacuums the church building, etc. These are all going to be rewarded. 
So even the smallest task done for the sake of the Lord will not lose its reward. And now we see the fulfillment of this. There's several passages, three of the Gospels uh, speak about this. We see uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. We see Mark chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. Also Luke chapter 9, verse 6. Now with these words, Jesus had finished uh, commanding his 12 disciples. That's in Matthew 11, verse 1. Again, what we see here is that uh, Matthew emphasized again that Jesus addressed these instructions specifically to the apostles. Now, having received this very lengthy commission, they now went out to fulfill it. And part of their message was repentance. It says, uh, uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 12 says, and they went out and preached uh, that men should repent. Now, remember, well, you should know that the, the word repent means to change one's mind or it means to do a, basically it means to do a, an about face, to do a 180. So what did the people need to change their minds about? Well, they needed to change their minds about Jesus and the fact that Jesus was not demon possessed as the leadership of Israel were saying. So those individuals who changed their mind about Jesus actually received salvation and they then became members of the believing remnant of that day. So they had what they had to repent of here was the belief that Jesus was demon possessed. They had to change their mind about that. And we see, we see Peter talking to Jews in, in, uh, in Acts, repent and believe. Change your minds about Jesus that he's not demon possessed and believe on him. Okay, now we come to the, the section where we see the death of the herald. You remember the herald of Jesus was, was John the baptizer. And we see this in chapter 14 of Matthew verses 1 to 12. Also in Mark 6, 14 to 29, and Luke uh, chapter 9, 7 to 9. John, uh, John the baptizer, he had an active ministry for around about 12 to 14 months. And then he was inactive because he, he, he spent just under two years in prison. So altogether, um, he was in the public eye for about three years. Somewhere around that. Now, it was only at this point that Herod the Tetrarch start hearing about Jesus's miracles. Uh, and we see this in, in, uh, in um, Matthew 14, verse 1. And this, this, this one, this Herod here is Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas was a nominal convert to Judaism. And uh, the sons of Herod the Great... Uh, these and this is he is the son of Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus in Bethlehem when he was uh, two years old. So he's one of those sons. Now Mark six fourteen calls him a king, but he's he's, he's technically he's simply a what would be called a client king of the Roman Empire, or, or actually he was a tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, and we see he was there from about four BC to thirty nine AD. Now, from what the, the, the gospel writers uh, write, we know that uh, by the time that Antipas had heard of Jesus, John had already been executed. Because uh, in, in Matthew 14, 2, it says that this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. Uh, and this is the point of, of Mark uh, 6, verse 14, simply because at this time, uh, John was dead. And so Antipas thinks Jesus is, is John risen from the dead. So he wants to, Antipas wants to see the man he assumed was the risen John who performed all these miracles. And you can find that in Luke chapter 9, verse 9. Now, having said this, uh, the gospel writers, they then go on to tell us what happened to John. You know, John's arrest was uh, instigated by Herodias, uh, that was Herod's wife, and we see that in Matthew uh, verse 3 um, of Matthew 14, 
for Herod had laid hold and, on John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now, her name's Herodias, uh, which means that she was a member of the Herodian dynasty. Uh, she was a granddaughter of Herod the Great. So Herod the Great had a number of different sons by a number of different women. And uh, his favorite wife was Mariamne. And she had a son named Aristobulus, Aristobulus the father of Herodias. So this is the Herodias we're talking about. Now, uh, because of his paranoia, Herod imagined his family members were actually conspiring against him. So he had several of them executed. And lo and behold, his favorite wife, Mariamne, and Aristobulus was amongst those. So she wasn't that favorite. Now, speaking about Herodias, uh, this is the, the, the granddaughter of, of Herod. Um, she, her, her first marriage was to Philip, who happened to be another son of Herod by another wife. So she married her half-uncle. Um, she's very colorful, this one. Now, having been married to Philip for a while, she left Philip, and then she was a mistress to another step-uncle. And sometime after that, she now married uh, the Herod here, Herod Antipas. Um, but she married Antipas while Philip, her husband, was still living. And also, uh, Antipas married her while his former wife was still living. And remember, uh, the, Herod is a, is a nominal Jew, so he's a, 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 a convert to Judaism. So if you put it all, all together, uh, she was uh, guilty of triple adultery and a, a couple of counts of incest. And it was her lifestyle and her marriage to Antipas that John was denouncing. And we see in Mark 6, 18, it is not, this is John speaking, uh, uh, shouting out to them, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Why? Because it means that you're committing adultery. Because your brother is still alive and it's her wife and your wife is still alive and you're both committing adultery. So by marrying, uh, here we see in Luke 14, 1 to 12, by marrying uh, his brother's wife, uh, he violated the Mosaic law in Leviticus 18, verse 16, and Leviticus 20, verse 21. Now, Herodias, by marrying her uncle, she violated Leviticus 18, 12 to 14, and Leviticus 20, 19 to 20. So what we see here is that Herodias did not want to be reprimanded for sins, her sins. So what she did was she wanted John arrested. And Herod granted her request. But because Herod feared John, we see in Mark uh, chapter 6, verse 20, knowing that he was a righteous man. That's why he feared him. He had him arrested but not killed, but he kept him in prison. So Antipas, Herod Antipas, he, he, was, he was happy to listen to the baptizer for he recognized the truth, but he was much perplexed, it says in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Why? Because he was, he was unwilling to rectify his sin problem. Um, now, and one of his birthdays, his birthday comes around, and, uh, you know, we have all the, the, the nobility and all the high military and civil officials of Galilee. They're there. And uh, during this party, Herodias' daughter, Salome, or, or Shulamit, Hebrew, she danced at this party and she pleased Herod. Uh, and so Antipas, he, he, what he, he did was he made a, a, a very rash, he made a very rash oath that she could have anything that she wanted up to half his kingdom. Uh, and we see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. Now, she doesn't know what to ask for. So she asked her mother, Herodias, and her mother told her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. And then we see in Matthew 14, verse 8, uh, though her mother, or uh, through her mother, she asked for John's head. Uh, there was no reluctance on uh, Salome's part 
because in verse five uh, uh, of Mark six, it says she came in straight away with haste onto the king for she was anxious to witness the beheading. I will that you forthwith give me on a platter the head of John the baptizer. Now Antipas tried to talk her out of it, but couldn't. And so to keep his oath, he had John beheaded. And his head was then placed in a platter and handed to Salome, who gave it to Herodias, Herod Antipas's wife. And then later on, we see that John, uh, John's disciples, they went and fetched the body and they buried it in a tomb. We see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 29. And then they then told Jesus what happened in Matthew 14, 12. Now, Josephus, the, the, the Jewish historian, uh, he provides an account of the death of John. And in it, he twice refers to a belief among the Jews that Antipas suffered the loss of an army as a divine judgment for the execution of John the Baptist. Now, as for the daughter Salome, she was later married to her uncle Philip II, and she shortly after that became a widow, and she died uh, quite young of a hideous disease, and so she did not escape divine justice for her role in the beheading of John. And then Herod Antipas and Herodias were later exiled to Gaul after they made a wrong step uh, politically. Now, what we see here that's clear from the Gospels is that John was arrested and killed for personal reasons. And Josephus points out that the actual charge was political. So the Gospels record that he was arrested and killed for personal reasons but the actual charge was a political charge. And again, what we see here now is that for the last time, what we will see is what happens to the herald will also happen to the king. And from this point on, Jesus will be moving to his own coming death. In paragraphs 74 to 98, this is, covers the training of the 12 by the king. And this period lasted from Passover uh, to just shortly before the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is around about 29 AD. And this will cover a six month period of that time. And during this period, we see that Jesus will make four journeys or, or withdrawals outside the land, outside of Israel, into Gentile territory where the Jewish population was a minority. And in general, these withdrawals will put him outside the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas, who was trying to see him. So he'd be, he'd be in territory on the Herod Philip II, known as Philip the Tetrarch, Antipas's half-brother. So this is the northeast part of his father's kingdom, including Iturea and Trachonitis. Now, in these withdrawals, Jesus is generally in the mountainous regions. And again, the primary purpose of this is the instruction of the 12. So here he's training the apostles for their future mission that they'll accomplish in the book of Acts. And these special instructions to the apostles are as a direct result of, <coughs> excuse me, of his rejection back in paragraph 62 and with the nature of the unpardonable sin back there. So John places the next event, the feeding of the 5,000, near Passover, uh, because he states here in, in John chapter 6, verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So this would be the third Passover of Jesus' public uh, ministry. So his ministry was now two years old, and he would now die in a year's time. So we see the feeding of the 5,000, and we see this in, in, Mark, in Matthew 14, 13 to 21, uh, Mark 6, 30 to 44, Luke 9, 10 to 17, and John 6, 1 to 13. So this now is a two-year point since his public ministry, 
uh, but it also marks the beginning of his final year of his ministry. So this paragraph here marks the final, the beginning of the, uh, of the final year of his ministry, and he's going to die at the following Passover the following year. Now we see here uh, the miracle of the feeding, and uh, this is this is a very unique miracle because it's the only miracle performed by Jesus, and all four gospels recorded it. Uh, this is the only one. It's also the fourth. Uh, it's the fourth of John's seven signs, and this miracle is to instruct the disciples. And the purpose of it is to teach them the nature of the ministry that he, he's going to be entrusting to them and instruction uh, of his ability to provide for their needs. So he's going to, he's going to prove to them that I can provide for your needs uh, in, in the ministry that you're going to be going into. So this whole thing started, uh, uh, we see in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, because as the apostles had come back from their uh, from came back from their teaching and preaching tour, they were relaying everything to him that had happened. Um, he had sent them out two by two, and their success was obvious. And now Jesus invited them to take a rest for a while. And we see here in Mark six, and he said unto them, "Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place." And rest a while, for there were a many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So they were under the pump. People were coming everywhere to see them. So what they did was they boarded a boat and they went across the Bethsaida, Julius. Um, and but what we see is that the multitudes followed him on the land. They weren't letting them get away. So we're going to see that uh, there's going to be 5,000 men. That's 5,000 men plus women and children are going to be fed. And the purpose, again, is for the training of the 12. And so what we're going to see is that these miracles uh, will be teaching points for the disciples, e even though uh, many others may benefit from it, but it's specifically for the teaching of the disciples. And he's going to have... Uh, several private conversations with different disciples, uh, which we'll see in the text here. So again, we, we need to see that Jesus is moving from uh, the masses to the individuals. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 10, it says that they withdrew apart. So when Jesus and the disciples traveled by boat to Bethsaida, Julius uh, this 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 Bethsaida was on the northeast coast of the Sea of Galilee, and it needs to be distinguished from the Bethsaida of Galilee, which is in the Jewish territory, uh, that was, which is on the other coast, uh, the, the northwestern coast. And that was the home of Peter, Andrew, and Philip. So that's on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee or, or the Sea of Tiberias. So this boat trips about four or five miles uh, and Matthew uh, chapter 14 uh, records in verse 13 that the multitudes followed him on foot from the cities and Mark says all the cities and John 6 verse 2 says a great multitude followed him uh, and Luke 9 says the multitudes followed him. So obviously the multitudes were following Jesus on foot. So all four, account, all four gospel accounts show that the interest of the masses or multitudes was quite strong in following Jesus. So what we've seen here is that they have not yet fully accepted uh, their leader's explanation that Jesus is demon-possessed, that his power was from Beelzebub. Uh, and uh, why was it strong? It was strong because of the signs that they saw him do. It was also strong because of the physical benefits, which we which we're going to see later later on in paragraph seventy eight, that they had been receiving. So the focus of the people was on the physical benefits and not on the spiritual appropriation. So while Jesus, what we see here, while Jesus and the apostles they sail across to Bethsaida, Julius, the people follow, and that was about ten miles by foot. 
And again, John chapter 6, verse 2 gives us the reason why the multitudes are following him. It was because of the signs that he did. Uh, they're not affirming his messianic claims, but they're simply following him because of the signs and the material benefits they received from these signs, uh, which, which is about to happen shortly. In now Mark 6, verse 34, it says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were as sheep having no shepherd. And Matthew 14, verse 14 says uh, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. Same thing in Luke 9, 11. He spake to them of the kingdom of God and those who had need he healed. So first off, we need to notice personal need and because of personal need, he had and he had and also because he had compassion on them and continued his ministry of healing uh, but secondly we also notice here uh, his view of the sheep it's remember it's not the job of the sheep uh, to look for food it's the job of the shepherds to make sure that the flock have food and again it, 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 we see here it says you know they were as sheep not having a shepherd so it, it, that's in Mark 6, verse 34. So what we see here is that uh, the issue in their mind was, you know, which shepherd do we follow? Do we follow Jesus or do we follow the previous shepherds we had, which were the Pharisees? We, which ones do we follow? The old shepherds or the new ones? So that's why their indecision made them look like sheep not having a shepherd. And then Luke Chapter 9, verse 11, in this verse, we actually see him exercising the ministry of a pastor teacher. And he does three things here. Uh, first of all, he's teaching them the truth. Uh, secondly, he's tending, tending to the flock by healing them. And uh, the third thing we see is that he is also feeding the flock by meeting a specific physical need. However, his continual conversation with the apostles show that it was always intended to be a lesson for them. So even though he taught and healed the masses, the purpose was to get away from the masses, but they followed him. And since they did, he was going to use them as a backdrop to teach the, the, the disciples these lessons they had to learn. And we see here now there's some personal questioning of individual disciples. Yeah. And for John 6, verse 5, says that Jesus came up to Philip and asked him, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? Now, why is he asking Philip this question? Because this happens to be Philip's home territory, uh, as we know from back in John 1, verse 43. So being from the territory, Philip would know two specific things. <laughs> Number one, he would know that there was not enough food in the area for such a large crowd. Uh, and also, Philip would also know that even if there was food available uh, within, the, within the, uh, the, the 12 group, within the apostolic circle, they would not have the money to buy it. Then we see in, in Mark verse 37, it, it says they had 200 denarii. Now, uh, a denarii is, is a day's wage. Uh, we find it out from Matthew 20 verse 2. But even with 200 denarii, it was not enough to feed this crowd. And John says so in verse 7. He says 200 denarii, this is John 6 verse 7, he says 200 denarii uh, worth of bread is not sufficient to feed them. Now in that day, one denarius would buy 10 quarts of wheat or, or 30 quarts of barley, but even that would not be enough. Uh, also, the fact is that the area did not have that much food available anyway. So 200 denarii would have bought 2,000 quarts of wheat or 6,000 quarts of barley. But even this was not enough to feed the multitude of people who were now present. Remember, we have 5,000 men plus women and children. Now, up to this point... Philip is involved in this conversation, but now another apostle is brought into the conversation in John 6, verse 8. It's now Andrew. Uh, this is Peter's brother. He comes on the scene and he has a lunch from a lad who had five barley loaves and two fishes. 
And he says, but one of these among so many. The question here is still before the disciples with this boy's lunch and their 200 denarii. But also what we see here is that even if there was, even if there was enough money, there was not enough food in the area to support this crowd. So what do the disciples do? Now, what we see here is that Jesus instructs the disciples, and we see this in Mark uh, verse 40, he instructs the disciples to get the crowd uh, seated in groups. Uh, so we are obviously dealing with different uh, categories of people. And it says they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Uh, this is Mark 6 verse 40. So John, this is you now John, he observed here that there was much grass in the place. We see that in John 6:10. And this would be true around about Passover, which is early spring. Uh, even in the desert areas, it's grassed. So now the disciples do this, they set them out in groups of 50 and 100. And at this point, all four gospels record here that Jesus, he took the bread and the fish. And Matthew 14, 9, Matthew chapter 14, verse 19, sorry, tells us that he gave the special blessing over the bread and the fishes. And then he started giving them to the disciples to distribute to the multitudes. And the blessing he would have said would have been, would be, would have been blessed be you, O Lord, our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. That is a typical uh, Jewish thanksgiving. Now, at this point, at this point, the bread and the fish just kept coming and coming and coming. Uh, remember, we only have five barley loaves and two fish. Luke chapter 9, verse 17 says, and they did eat and were all filled. In fact, <laughs> there was enough to feed everyone. But in Mark chapter 6, verse 43, there were 12 basketfuls left over of the bread and fish. So the five barley loaves and the two fish fed the 5,000 men plus, and it also had 12 baskets of bread and fish left over. Now, in Matthew 14, 21, we see the figure is 5,000 men, and that's what's given there in addition to all the women and children. So, the actual figure was much larger than the number of men present. Now, what is the teaching point for the disciples? That's, that's Remember, it's about teaching the disciples here. So what's the teaching point? Um, this, this miracle here, it's intended uh, as a teaching tool for the disciples. Uh, and Jesus reminded them of this incident later on. What it did here was it introduced his teaching about the nature of the ministry that was now entrusted to them. At that time, theirs was a physical ministry, but later on, it's going to be a spiritual one. And the apostles learned at least three lessons here. First of all, they were the ones who were responsible for feeding the people, because Luke 9 verse 13 says, give you them to eat. So Jesus says, you guys give them the food. So at this point, it was a physical feeding, but later on, it's going to be a spiritual feeding. The second thing here is that they had to realize that they were totally incapable of feeding the multitudes by themselves. Uh, we saw that back in John 6, 5 to 9, uh, in this conversation with, with Philip and Andrew. And so the third thing we see here, or well, the third lesson they need to learn here is that they were simply to distribute what the Messiah provided. So he, Messiah, gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples to the multitudes. We see that in Matthew 14, verse 19. So they are the three lessons. They're responsible for feeding the people. Uh, they had to realize that they themselves were incapable of, of feeding the multitudes. And they simply learned that they had to distribute what Messiah gave them to distribute. Now, this event here is a, is a, is a direct result of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. This is the, this is the, the offer in Galilee uh, uh, to make Jesus king. 
Um, Jesus sent his disciples by boat uh, to Western Bethsaida, which is back into the Jewish territory. And now he intends to dismiss the multitudes and send them home. We see that in Matthew 14, verse 22. So we're currently in a, in a section with Matthew 14, 22 to 23, Mark 6, 45 to 46, and John uh, 6, 14 to 15. In John 6, 14, uh, the masses, they've seen this miracle and they now declare Jesus to be the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, 15, verse 18. Uh, this is of a truth, the prophet that comes into the world. This is, this is the prophet that Moses uh, told the people about. He says, hear ye him. And these guys are saying this is the prophet, so they should be hearing him. Now, what we see here is that because they're all fed and full, this guy is fantastic. We need to make him king of Galilee. Uh, we see that in John 6, verse 15. Their motive was, we want this guy to provide food for us on an ongoing basis. He's great. He should be our king. Now, at this point, uh, when Jesus perceived that they were forcibly going to make him king of Galilee, he separates himself from them and withdrew again into the mountain himself alone. And uh, again, we see this in, in, in John 6, 15. And here, at this time, he does succeed in being alone. And now, he, what we see here is that he begins praying. We see that in, in Mark 6, 46. Three basic reasons why he rejected their offer. Uh, the first, the leadership of Israel had already rejected his messiahship. The unpardonable sin had been committed and the point of no return had been reached. So it's too late to try to crown him king now because that, that, that horse is bolted. And the second thing is they're only trying to make him king over Galilee. But the Jewish prophecies such as Psalm uh, 2 verse 6, for example, they declared that Messiah was to be enthroned in Jerusalem, not Galilee. Uh, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So uh, Galilee is not the place of his enthronement. It has to be in Jerusalem. And the third thing is, well, which is a pretty obvious one, their motivation is totally skewed. It's totally wrong. They want to make him king only because they were fed, only because their physical needs were met. Uh, being fed and not having to work for it, that's a great program. <laughs> uh, and they wanted to keep it up. They want, like, we want this. So Jesus now addresses the issue of wrong motivation uh, when he meets these Galileans at a later time in, in paragraph 78. Now, we now uh, look at the training through the storm, and we see this in, in, uh, in Matthew 14, 24 to 33, Mark 6, 47 to 52, and John 6, 16 to 21. Uh, and this event here, uh, this uh, storm, training through the storm, this is the fifth of John's seven signs. And the other lesson for the apostles is that they were to be dependent upon the Messiah in any and every situation. Remember, Jesus sent him by way of the sea to Capernaum uh, back in, uh, we see in John 6, 17, and he went to the mountain to pray. Now, in uh, what we see, the lesson here is, for the apostles here is a lesson on dependence on the Messiah. They're separated from him. Uh, they're, they're, in, they're in the boat. They're heading across to the other side. And they find themselves in a, in a pretty dire situation. And three of the gospel accounts uh, tells us the predicament involved. And uh, what we see here is three of the gospels tell us, first of all, that uh, the timing of the storm, the location of the boat, the duration of their struggle on board, and the hopelessness of the situation. So that the three gospel writers are all agreed on this. 
Now, what's the situation? It is now sunset. Uh, and this comes out uh, in Mark's account in Mark 647. It says, when evening, evening was come, it's just evening time. And in John 6 verse 17 says, it was now dark. So sunset's gone. That's the first thing. So at sunset, second thing is that the storm hit them when they were in the middle of the lake, uh, middle of the sea. Uh, we see this in Matthew 14, verse 24. It says, Matthew writes, for the boat was in the midst of the sea. So for the second time in the Gospels, the, these sudden winds came down, causing a storm to rage across the sea. And here it is at this point that those sudden winds come down upon the lake, as we saw back in paragraph 67. The third thing we see here is that they were, they were in the storm a total of nine hours. Mark uh, chapter 6 verse 47 tells us that they began sailing when the sun was setting. Uh, then in verse 48, it says that about the fourth watch of the night, and then Matthew uh, uh, verse, uh, uh, chapter 14 verse 25 tells us the fourth watch of the night. So the fourth watch of the night is between uh, 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So although they were in the storm about nine hours altogether, um, incidentally, the, um, uh, in the first century, Roman usage of, of, of time uh, at night was divided into um, four uh, watches. Um, a watch uh, was, a, was a period of time where a group of, of soldiers stood guard before being relieved. Uh, so we had the, the four watches were the evening watch, which was 6 to 9 p.m., the midnight watch, which is 9 to 12 p.m., the cock crowing, which was 12 to 3 a.m., and then the morning watch was 3 to 6 a.m. Now, so that's just a bit of incident there. Now, the, the, fourth, thing, the fourth thing here that we find is that they are in a, in a totally hopeless situation because Mark 6 verse 48 says they were distressed in rowing for the wind was contrary to them. And then John 6 18 says uh, that the sea was rising by reason of a great wind that blew. Verse 19 of John says that they rowed 25 to 30 furlongs which is about three and a half miles, which is about, or ran about six kilometers. Uh, so it took nine hours to go six kilometers, three and a half miles. And they were still in the middle of the lake. So they're struggling. And these disciples, remember, they're in the boat by themselves because Jesus had already sent them ahead. He, he was going to walk back. Uh, however, he was conscious of their situation because from the land, he saw their distress because uh, we, we see this in Mark 6, 47 to 48. In all that time, uh, John 6, verse 17 says, Jesus had not yet come to them. But now they see him walking in the water. Uh, and, and in Mark 6, verse 48, it says that he was walking in the sea, but in a direction that would have passed by them. So the lesson for them to learn by him passing by was that they had to call out to him for help. And when they see him, as Mark records in verse 49, they think they're looking at, at an apparition like a ghost and they cried out. And in Matthew 14, 26, they said that it was an apparition and they cried out for fear. It's a ghost. They had fear because they, they supposed that this apparition was the angel of death. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 50, Jesus now comforts them and, and says to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Um, and this, this, the, the Greek word here for to be of good cheer, it's the, it, is the only time it's used in the New Testament in, in relation to the Messiah and no one else, no one else has uses it like this. So once they realize that it is Jesus walking in the water, their fear is now calm, and they were now willing to receive him into the boat, according to John chapter 6, verse 21. Now, Matthew added the account of Peter and, and his part, because in Matthew 14, 28, Peter asks in faith, 
if he be allowed to come to Jesus on the walking in the water by himself. Please, Jesus, can I come walking on the water to you? And verse 29 tells us that Jesus calls Peter to come, come to him on the water. And now Peter went down from the boat and he walked on the water to go to his Messiah. Now, Jesus permits this miracle for Peter's benefit. And, and, and as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on water. But then in Matthew 14, verse 30, Peter at some point took his eyes off Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. So Peter does not wait till he sinks to cry out for help. So as he, so as he sinks, Peter then called on Jesus for help. And we see in Matthew 14, 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him. Peter's lesson from this is that he must not only start out in faith, but, but Peter and, and us, we also must continue to walk in faith and dependence on Jesus. So this is what Jesus meant when he said in verse 31 of Matthew, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And this was a lesson in faith for Peter, for he has to continue walking in faith and not doubting life's entire walk. Also, the lesson here included the principle that obedience to Jesus' command does not immediately remove all obstacles. Jesus did command Peter to come to him, but that did not guarantee that the wind would cease. The wind was still blowing, which is what caused Peter to become so fearful. So obedience to Jesus' commands does not necessarily remove the obstacles. We should not assume that because of obstacles in our path, that we are outside the Lord's will or that we have misinterpreted his command. The obstacles may still be there and we have to allow God to remove the obstacles in his time. Now, only when Jesus got into the boat did the winds cease. And we see this in both Matthew 14, 32 and Mark 6, 51. And John, John said also that straight away the boat was at land whither they were going. No more rowing or struggling. Remember, they were in the middle of the lake. Once Jesus hopped into that boat, they're now at land. No more, no more storm or anything. So the lesson they must learn is that they must always depend on the Messiah in any and all situations. They should have learned this lesson, the feeding of the 5,000. And that's, this is a point made by Mark chapter 6, 51 to 52. It says, and they were sore amazed in themselves, for they understood not concerning the loaves, but their heart was hardened. So their failure to learn that lesson of Jesus providing explained why they were so fearful in the boat. In Matthew 14, 33, it states there, and they that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And here they have very good theology. Jesus is the Son of God, but they had very poor application for they have not yet learned to depend on him for all things. So they had bad application. They became fearful in a situation in which they should have trusted the Lord. The spiritual life without good theology is, uh, it's impossible. You need to have good theology. If you do not have good theology, you will not have victory in the spiritual life. On the other hand, a good theology without good application will result in spiritual deadness. There needs to be good theology applied to the daily life of you and I. Okay, that is it.